you, thank you. Before we get into the word, please let's just open in prayer. Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bless you, we thank you, we bring you glory, honor, praise, and thanks, Father. For we acknowledge in this day that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the Alpha and Omega. You established everything and you will bring everything into fulfillment at the end of the ages. And we thank you for that, Father God. Lord, I thank you for every soul sitting here this morning because it is a divine appointment that they have with you as their Father on the throne that we are going to read about this morning, Father God. And so you woke us up this morning by your Spirit. You brought us here by your mercy. And by your grace, you are going to bless us this morning through the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God, Father. And Lord, if we are open and we are willing and we are definitely able through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, our lives will change forever today, Lord. And we will be able to see more clearly. We will be able to move closer to the throne of our Father in heaven, Lord. And, and we thank you for that, Father God. Lord, as we were worshipping, you dropped in my spirit to pray for this. And I only want to be obedient, Father God. So I even pray this morning for the babies that are in the service this morning. Lord, that maybe they can and maybe they can't understand our language that we are talking to them. But may the word of God, even in this day, move deep into their souls, hearts and spirits, Lord. And call them to the cross of Jesus Christ. That there may come a day that they will surrender their lives to Jesus and become powerful teachers and preachers of the Holy Word of God in this beautiful country of ours, Lord. Blessed, blessed be the, the name of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. And all God's people says, Amen, amen. and Amen. Family. Wow. I, I, I feel like I, I, I have to warm up for this message this morning. <laughs> because whew, this is, I've been spending two weeks on, on, on this message. Um, only because I'm a flawed human being. And the Lord is going to show us things this morning. Um, that it, it grabbed my attention for, for sure. So if you will allow me. I'm going to take the book of, of Revelation chapter 4, which we are in um, this morning, the, the throne of, um, of God, the throne of the Father. And we are going to break this up. We are only going to do the first six verses today. That's how much the Lord wants to show us in Revelation 4 concerning His throne. Now, family, sitting here this morning, if you are new to this, I want to paint a picture quickly. Many, many, many thousands of years ago, um, the, the heart of Father God was to create someone so that he could share his love with, with them. We all know the story in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve. And so he created Adam and Eve to be with him so he could display his glory and his mercy and his love and his affection to um, Adam and Eve. And we all know that we as, as human beings, we are flawed and we tend to listen to the, the, the next best thing or the, the, the thing that looks better than what God gave us. And so, unfortunately, that's what Adam and Eve did. We won't put any blame on, 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 on either one of them. Both of them had the same blame. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, as a family get that right this morning. And... Uh, and, and so they moved away from, from Father. It was not the heart or the intention of our Father um, for, for that to happen. They, Father God, wanted them and us today to be with Him. That is His heart, family. If you go through the Word of God, that is the story from Genesis straight through to Revelation up until where we are sitting today. The only thing or the one thing 
that our Father in heaven has been focusing on for thousands of years is getting us back to his throne. The one thing, family. And Father God has been doing that straight through the Old Testament. He did it through the New Testament with his son Jesus. He's doing it in today with the New Testament church. And family, that is why it is so important that when we, if, you, if the Lord decides to move you away from, from Altham to a different place, to seek a church where the shepherd fears God with his whole life and only preaches the truth of this book and nothing else. He doesn't lay his opinion on the, the message he doesn't bring any of his flesh in it. He preaches the truth of the word of God. I want to encourage you, family, wherever you go, to do that. Even if it takes you half a year to find a solid church that worships God in spirit and in truth and preaches the truth of this, go and do that. Amen? So many people go and look for churches that give good messages. Yeah? Well, that message made me feel, woo! but did it encourage me to challenge myself to change my life, to get closer to the throne of the Father? That's the question we must ask. And so this morning, family, we're going to get into absolutely beautiful revelation that the Lord wants to show us um, uh, 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 about the throne. So, revelation. Chapter 4. I'm going to read it up until verse 6. And then if you'll permit me, I want to take verse for verse, family, and break it open and show what Father God has shown me over the past two weeks to give to His people. Amen? Family, we must, when we wake up Sunday mornings, we must say this to ourselves, is that I'm going to church this morning to receive a message from the Father's heart for me. Amen. That's how much He loves me. That's how we had word this morning. I think it was Sister Maria that said that, that we, the, the Lord calls us to change us, to be like He wants us to be. Amen. It is arrogant of me to think that when I come to the cross, I'm perfect. I'm the man. Lord, just tell me what you need. I'll go and do it for you. No. The, the Lord first works in our lives. Amen. He refines us in that fire. And, and sometimes, most of the times, if you are a true disciple of Jesus, it hurts. Amen. But family, the victory that we gain out of that outweighs the hurt. I know that. And so... Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what is to take place after this. At once, I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, a rainbow that shone like emerald, encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and pearls of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal amen and amen now family we're going to get into this 
verse by verse. This is what the Lord showed me to give to you today. Family, the intention with today's message is, this morning's message, before I even start it, ask yourself the question, how can I as a son or daughter draw closer to the throne of the Father? That's the question. Amen? And so, if you have any knowledge of the Word of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament, you will see that straight through the Bible, the Lord created things for His people to show them how to get to the throne. Once Father God took the Israelites... This seems very rude. Um, when Father God took the Israelites out of Egypt and brought them into the desert, one of the first things he told them to do was to build a tabernacle. And the tabernacle represents how to get to the Father. He showed them there clearly. He, he didn't, it, it wasn't hidden. He taught them every step of the tabernacle how to get to the throne of Father God. If we read the Word of God and we read Exodus, we can see that one of the first tabernacles that especially Moses encounters is Mount Sinai. Because there was an outer court, there was an inner court, and there was a holy of holies. And in the, the, the Word of God, only the priest once a year was allowed into the holy of holies. Nobody else. And this man had to be pure and clean. No, no sin in his life. And so the Lord even told the Israelites, don't touch the foot of this mountain. Because it was only for Moses to, to, to be able to do that. And Moses went up into the Holy of Holies in the first depiction of the tabernacle on Mount Sinai. He comes down, gives them the law. After that, the Lord breaks open to them how they must build this tabernacle. One that they can fold up if the pillar of cloud and, and fire moves they can fold up the tabernacle and they can move and they can set it up wherever they get there again to present sacrifices for their sins and so on and so on and so as we get into the book of revelation chapter 4 we must read this as if we are stepping into the tabernacle because that is the picture that jesus is painting for john here amen and so we start off with the next uh, um, clip, please, uh, Sister Sonia. There we go. Verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Note that Jesus shows John a door, firstly, that is already open. Secondly, the door is in heaven. So he is calling John to move towards the open door in heaven, not the closed doors on earth that the motivational speakers tell us we can open. Amen? No. Move to the door in heaven that's already open. Amen? And then I, I just made notes there as the Lord spoke to me for um, his sons and daughters Take note that it does not say there was a door to heaven, but it says that it's a door in heaven. And what was, I asked the question, what was this door? And it goes further. We will see that the door um, is, is uh, the door to the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. So this is a door that leads to the throne of the Father. Who would not want to step through that door? Amen. If you love Father God with everything inside of you, if you love for Him, if you seek Him, you read your Bible day and night, you pray every moment that you get, you show people the love of Jesus, why would we not want to move through that door? Not only move, run! Amen? And listen to this, family. I, I met Jesus face to face. There are some of us sitting here this morning that has met Jesus face to face. And I cannot describe to anyone that longing that I have for that, that same interaction with Christ again. And for 23 years, I've been chasing that. 
And I can only imagine John. John walked with Jesus on earth. John saw the miracles that Jesus performed. Jesus sat around the campfire at night and told them about this kingdom that he's building for who? For them. And if there's anyone that can paint a picture about the kingdom of God, it was Jesus, the son of God. Because he came from there. And now he's sitting around the campfire and he's telling them. And then all of a sudden Jesus is crucified and taken away from them. These disciples must start churches. They start churches. It doesn't go the way that the Lord told them it, it might go or might not go. And they encounter some problems and they are, um, they, they are imprisoned. And John is sitting in this dark, moldy, musty, wet prison. And Jesus appears to him plus minus 60 years after he saw him the last time. Can you imagine, family, what must have been going on in that old man's mind? Especially his mind. I think it's not in the, 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 the word, but I'm thinking he cried out and he said, Lord Jesus, thank you. I, 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 I'm done, Lord. I can't do this anymore. Please take me home. And then to have Jesus say to him, I'm sorry, my boy, I'm only here to give you a message to give to the church. You're not going with me yet. Family. That's what I'm talking about. That desire to go with Jesus. And again, I wasn't there in the prison cell with John, but you can only imagine every now and then John trying to, to, to cling to Jesus, trying to grab a hold of him because he doesn't want to be there anymore. Amen. And so we go to the next clip, please, um, Sister Sonia. And it goes on from there. And it says, And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, now, here yeah, again, um, what the Lord shared with me for you, John is speaking of the voice he first heard in, uh, in Revelation 1.10. So, it's the same Jesus speaking to him. Now, remember we said this last week, is that uh, when, when John started writing Revelation, he showed us what was. He, he told us who he was, where he came from. Then we went over into two and three in, in the, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And Jesus was there through John telling us what was at that, that time. What is. So what was and what is. And now John is moving in this vision towards what will come. This whole vision that we are seeing here is a vision that has happened after the ascension of Jesus. What is going to happen from there on for us sitting here in the New Testament church today? So the same voice is now sharing the second vision. It goes on. What must take place after this? This is exactly what I said now. So he is showing John to show us what's going to still take place. So a lot of these things that we are going to read for the rest of the book of Revelation must still take place. And for those who desire to see the second coming of the Lord, I'm thinking you're sitting here the same as me going, Woo -hoo! I, I want to know what's happening next. Amen. So that I'm ready. That's the sign that the Lord was speaking about. That's the sign that Jesus mentioned in, in Matthew. Oh, there's two more signs that are in Revelation. We are getting closer. Amen. To going home. Family. If you are sitting here this morning and you're like me and you are tired of sitting at a bus stop. <laughs> this earth is, we're not supposed to be here. Amen. Other than preaching the gospel, we must go to our Father. And so the next uh, um, um, uh, clip, please, uh, Sister Sonia. So we are going to look at the, the importance of the tabernacle here. Okay. Firstly, the purpose of the tabernacle or the sanctuary was to deal with sin. Amen. Father God set that tabernacle up in the desert so his people could deal with their sin. So that when the sin was dealt with, they could then successfully get to the throne. Does that make sense? That's why Jesus came to deal with my sins and with your sins so that we can successfully get to the throne. That's the goal, family. If you were in, in your younger days, 
a, a athlete and you did two, uh, 100 or 200 meter race, your goal was to get to that end line. And by the way, to get there first. Amen. And Paul teaches us that we are in a race, family. And there's people next to us that want to trip you. And when you fall and they want to run over you. And so, yeah, the first, the, the purpose of the sanctuary was to deal with the sin problem so that God could dwell with his people. Exodus 25, 8. Then have them make a sanctuary or a tabernacle for me and I will dwell among them. Family, if, if you have a visit from an angel tonight and an angel says to you, you have to do this and this in your life and when you've done that, Jesus will come and sit with you every night and visit you. Will you do that or not? Yes. Whatever it is that that angel showed me, I will do it immediately just to be in the presence of Jesus, my King. And here, this was the aim of the tabernacle, was to get them closer to the Father. The, the next one, please, uh, Sister Sonia. So number two, um, the second one is the main focus of Revelation is, is what is about to take place after the ascension of Jesus. I mentioned that in number three. There are seven stages in the ministry of Jesus in the tabernacle. And we're going to have a look at them now. It, 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 family, if you haven't seen this before, this is what it's going to do to your mind. <laughs> Amen. To see what Jesus came to do for us. And so many times, family, we walk around and think, Hey Lord, what can I do for you? No, my boy, it's the other way around. You can't do anything unless I permit you to do it. Amen. 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 We're going to get to that scripture for anyone that's questioning that. So, where's my pointy thing imagery? If we go to the next one, we can see here the tabernacle. The very first thing, you, you now I'm speaking out of the book of Exodus when the tabernacle was built. If you want to go in your quiet time, you can go. Uh, and, and from Exodus 32, you can go straight through and you can see, see there. The very first thing is Jesus lived a perfect life in the camp. <coughs> Moses was called by Father God to live a perfect life among the Israelites. That's why he set up a tent of meeting outside of the camp to meet with Father God every single day to make sure that he stays pure. Amen. For anyone that wants this, uh, um, please just go to one of the elders afterwards. I'll send you this whole, um, this whole thing. We'll email it to you. Um, the second thing is, Jesus bears the sins of the whole world at the altar of sacrifice. That's what that represents. It's Jesus that took our sins. We didn't have to pay for it ourselves. All we have to do, and I'm saying all, it, it, it takes a lot of effort. All we have to do is submit to Christ. That's all. Do what he says. Follow him. Where he points to, to me, I must go. When he speaks to me, I must listen. That's it. The next one is the basin or the labor represents the resurrection of Jesus. That's that wash basin there. So here is Jesus being sacrificed. And, and here is the resurrection of Jesus. You can see that even in the Old Testament, Father God was getting the, the, the Israelites ready for what is going to happen when His Son comes. Because Father saw that these people cannot do it on their own. They can't. For thousands of years, He's been calling them and they just could not get to the Father. Sin was too, sin was too yummy. Yeah? And unfortunately, family... You can go and have a look at every sin that's running around in this world today. You will not find one sin where any person will stand and say, No, I don't want to do that sin. It's too boring. No. Every sin that Satan pushes out into this world, is, is it, it, it makes us feel good, look good, feel powerful. Amen. So people are drawn to sin. And so the next one, Jesus en enters the most holy place 
as our mediator. Jesus said to the disciples, to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, to the crowds and to us, you will not get to the Father if you don't go through me. That's it. You won't. And so if you ever have the, the, the chance to speak to a Muslim and a Muslim says that they pray through, I, I, I can't sit down through this certain person or whatever, you can say to them, hey, my friend, that, that's good. But the only mediator to get to the throne of Father is Jesus. That's it. There is no other mediator. Christ takes us there, nothing and no one else. And so the next one is Jesus enters the most holy place and cleanses the sanctuary of the sin reported there. What does that mean? Jesus sits down next to the Father. And the Bible teaches us, I'm paraphrasing now, that Jesus says to the Father and Father says to Jesus, I, I've taken their sins on me. I've cleansed their sins. Amen. Jesus paid for something that we could not pay for at all. And so the next one is, Jesus takes the sins from the sanctuary and places them on the scapegoat. He makes Satan pay for what he did to his people. And family, you and I that serve the Lord, if we are waiting for that second coming, we're going to witness this. We're going to see this battle. Where the Lord takes Satan and the fallen angels and he binds them and he sends them to the pit of hell forever. Because of what they did to his creation. Amen. And then number seven, the last one. Jesus returns um, to our camp to live with us forever. Amen. We're going to read about that in the book of Revelation. When Jesus comes back to earth. He makes us kings and queens. And he, and, and he causes us to rule and reign. Amen. Amen. The next one please, Sister Sonia. This is, that was only verse one, family. <laughs> Verse 2. Let's see. At once. At once. I was in the spirit. So this is a vision. When I read this. I sat and I, 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 I was spending time with the Lord. And family. I received a word from the Lord. I, I, I've got the full word at home. But the, in a nutshell. Um, the Lord said to me. That this year is going to be a suddenly year. Suddenly. Amen. How many of us have been praying for something, not yet received it? How many of us have got a desire for something, not yet achieved it? I believe the Lord said, this is going to be a suddenly year. Amen. Yes. But, but family, don't stop praying. No, 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 no. Don't stop. Carry on. Praying, carry on seeking, carry on reading, carry on chasing, amen? Carry on running this race, don't go and sit. If the Lord speaks something over our lives, continue doing what He has called us to do. So, um, at once I was in the Spirit. So this is a, a vision that John is in. And there before me was a throne in heaven. This shows that the throne was already in place when John saw it the first time. Father God's throne has never moved. Amen. People have moved away from it. But the throne of the Father is there for eternity. And so he shows John this, this throne. If we can go to the next one please Sister Sonia. With some... Um, so on this throne with someone sitting on it. So John saw one sitting on the throne without stating who was sitting on the throne. Okay. So, so Jesus shows him someone on this throne that can never be moved, never be taken over, never. But he doesn't show him yet who sits on the throne. As we go deeper into the book of Revelation we will see that it's the Father. That's His home. That's where He lives. That's it. That's His throne. That's where His creation worships Him. He doesn't need to move from there. Amen? He chooses to, but He doesn't... Uh, or He can, but He doesn't need to. If we go to the, the, the next one, please. Now, again, we're back in the tabernacle. Um, the table of shoe bread. That represents in the tabernacle... The throne of God. Look how amazing this is, family. What does bread represent in the Word of God? Represents the Word of God. Amen? It also represents Jesus. What is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. 
Okay? So bread represents the word of God. This, this book, family. If your spirit is hungry, yeah, Tony Robbins can't fill it. This can. Amen? No motivational speaker on this earth, irrelevant of his net worth, can fill your void in your spirit when your spirit is hungry. They don't have the right food. Yeah? They've got junk food that they give you. And in a few hours' time, you're hungry again, and then you eat junk food again. No. You want good, wholesome food that fills you, that gets you to the next point of growth in your life. Eat the Word of God. That's it. And so, the, the, the table of shoe bread, um, bread represents the Word of God. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Amen? Not every second. Every word. Yep. That counts the discipline as well. Amen? Whoops, no amens. <laughs> Amen? The discipline as well. We go to the next one, please, Sister Sonia. Number two. We're still in verse two here. God's throne is on the side of the north, according to Isaiah 14, verse 13. There you can read that verse. For I have said in my heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. So the house of the Lord is in the north. If we have a look, um, the table of shoe bread in the tabernacle was set on the north, the north side. And so if we go to number three, right at the bottom there, the table of shoe bread means bread of presence. Family, that's all our father wants, is for us to be in his presence. That's all. That's what he's been calling for, for all this time in the word of God. Please just come to me. You are wasting your time. You're wasting your life. You, you, you are so unique. You've been created in my image, yet you can't see it because you are not in my presence. Amen. Just get the next ready here. <clears throat> I hope everyone is getting something out of this. <clears throat> I, I will encourage you to go home, family, and take these six verses. Sit down with the Holy Spirit, and then see um, what the Lord shows you outside of what we went through um, this morning. If we go to the next uh, one, please, uh, Sister Sonia. There we go. So, um, the only piece of furniture in the holy place that had two crowns was the table of shoe bread. If we have a look at Exodus 25, 24 to 25, um, just forgive my reading here. This is, this is the very, very King James Version. Um, and, and thou shalt overlay uh, it with gold and make thereto a crown of gold around it. And thou shalt make another unto it a border um, of the hand around that. I'm skipping a lot of words here. And thou shalt make a golden crown there. So crowns in the word of God represent kingship. Crowns represent victory. If we go to the next one at the, at the bottom there, there were also two piles of bread on the table. Leviticus 24 verse 6. Take the finest flour and bake 12 loaves. Interesting, 12. Keep in mind 12, family. 12, 12, 12. For the mathematicians here with us. Take the finest flour and bake 12 loaves of bread using two tenths of, of an ephra um, for each loaf. Arrange them in two stacks, six in each stack on the table, pure gold before the Lord. Did we see that, family? Twelve loaves, two stacks. The only table that was decorated with crowns. Now, if we go to the next uh, clip, please, Sister Sonia. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he sat at the right hand of the Father. There's the two crowns. Amen. Father God and Jesus, two crowns. And because they are both word, there's the two stacks of bread. How beautiful is this, family? Huh? 
And then you get people that read the Old Testament and they close it after two days and they say, this is confusing, I don't understand this. This is why, family. Because we are not reading the Word of God and making it personal. Amen? Hey, family. This book was written for you. You. Say that to yourself. This book was written for me. This is a love story from Father for me. So I must read this book every time I read it. I must read it as if, because this is exactly what happens. It comes straight out of the heart of Father God for me. A message for me. And what is the message in a nutshell um, from, from this book for me as God's son? Um, Jacques, um, life isn't about you. Amen. Life isn't about you. It's about Jesus and his people. That's it. Yep. Uh, again, not very many amens. We go from there. We, we now move into verse 3. Family, can you see how amazing it is if we sit down with the Holy Spirit? You take the, the, the Word of God verse for verse. It keeps you busy the whole day. Huh? Amen. And so verse 3. It's the next one, please, Sister Sonia. Thank you. And he who sat down there was like Jasper and saw the stone in appearance. Now, John often uses um, precious stones to, to describe. Now, family, John, if you know his background, was a fisherman. Okay? Wasn't a very fancy guy, didn't have a lot of money. And then Jesus called him into the ministry and Jesus then ascended to heaven, gave him a church to, to, to start. So he's still not a very wealthy man, but he knows what a precious stone is. And maybe even desired to own a precious stone in his life. And so this is the only thing, Brother Brian says this a lot. He said it in his introduction to Revelation um, message that um, when John speaks of things that Jesus showed him that he's never seen before, he says, it looks like this. You get what I'm saying? Jesus might have shown John um, army tanks and, 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 and airplanes. He'd never seen that before. So he says it looks like, the, looks like a beast coming out of the ocean. Amen? It shoots fire and kills people. Looks like a beast. And so here he describes the one who is sitting on the throne as a precious stone. Family, but still. If you had to see Father God on the throne now, this description would not do it justice. Amen? This is the closest to human language that this poor man could come up with. And so he said to us that it looks like this. If we go to the next clip, please, uh, Sister Sonia. And there was a rainbow around the throne. Now, the rainbow is a symbol of divine mercy. It also symbolizes that God is in a covenant, he's a covenant keeping God. Amen. And if you, he has a scripture for, for that uh, in Genesis where God said to, um, almost said Moses, God said to Noah um, in, in the flood that this is what I'm going to do, not only for you, but for the rest of my people, family. Every time, yeah, in New Zealand, let me say this, I, 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 I come from a different country. So I, I, I can say this. Yeah, in New Zealand, you've got most probably the most beautiful rainbows anywhere. They are shockingly beautiful here. Yeah. And, and, and almost every second day, driving the children to school, you can see one somewhere. And, and so every time we here, sitting here in New Zealand, this beautiful country, see a rainbow, not to say to ourselves, oh, another rainbow, mm, that's nice color. No, but to say to ourselves, Father, you're talking to me. Huh? That's the voice of God. Father God is saying there to you, seeing that, that, hey, I'm a promise-keeping God. Whatever you are going through right now in your life, whatever you are asking for, whatever you are desiring, whatever you are battling with, ask me. I am a promise-keeping God. And He speaks to us through something like that. Something that humans cannot create. Don't let the scientists fool you, family, and say they can make a rainbow. Nah, not like God can. 
Amen. 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 Love those amens. We go to the next one. And this is now. Now we go to verse 4. It might be some of us saying, yeah, hey, but please move along. I've got a chicken in the oven. I'm doing my best. <laughs> 4 verse 4, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Any, any mathematicians here? Let's get into that now. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, someone that loves studying the word of God and that has studied the word of God for a number of years, I have not yet publicly Please keep that in mind. I have not yet biblically found the answer to who these 24 elders are. Google has got a lot of suggestions, but I'm not a Google pastor. Amen. Amen. I preach the word of God. So I'm going to say this to the sons and daughters of God. If we go to the next clip, please. Um, there's a lot of debate uh, on who the elders are. Biblical evidence shows that they are created beings that have never sinned. To be able to sit around the throne of Father with your own throne, biblically shows you are sinless. Okay? Um, it, goes fur I, uh, it goes further, the Greek word translated for elders is never used to refer to as angels. So these are not angels, they are men. Amen? So... Um, it's not used for angels, only men, particularly men of a certain age, uh, mature and able to rule a church. Remember what Paul told us, how, how elders must, must look? Amen? There mustn't be people that you can walk over. No. There must be people with authority. And so it goes further, what the Lord shared with me for, for you. The word elder would be inappropriate to refer to as an angel. Um... Uh, because they don't have an age. Uh, their mode of dress would also indicate that they are men. While angels also appear in white, white garments are normally more commonly found on believers symbolizing Christ's righteousness. Amen? So if someone is sitting here this morning that has got the biblical evidence of who these elders are, you are welcome to come to one of the our elders afterwards and share it with us. And then next week we'll share it with uh, the rest of the congregation. Amen. Please keep in mind biblical evidence. Show scripture. Amen. No amens. And then <laughs> we go to the next one. Revelation 4 verse 5. There we go. From the throne. Oh, family, we're getting into the good things here now. Listen to this. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and pearls of thunder. <laughs> when God speaks, this is how it sounds. Amen. And, and I can remember um, uh, our daughter Faith, her first word was Yeshua. And, and, and I would go and do shopping with her and put her in the shopping cart and she would sing. The whole, through all the aisles, she would sing, Yeshua, Yeshua. Yeshua the whole time and, yeah. and then the first time we lived in an area where thunderstorms were, were huge like, like earth shaking huge and every time there was a thunder she, she, she would run into the house and say mommy mommy um, um, Jesus is talking yep he is <laughs> let's open our ears and listen amen and so um in, in Ezekiel's uh, vision, I'll invite you as well to go through the book of Ezekiel. Powerful, beautiful visions, uh, uh, dreams. Uh, in in uh, Ezekiel's vision, the throne of God, he describes uh, the movement of angelical beings around the throne. So Ezekiel 1, 4 and Ezekiel 10, 5, it's all there. We can send it to you. You can go and have a look at it. If we go to the next clip, please, uh, Sister Sonia. Uh, in front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. This clearly shows the throne is in the holy place before or opposite the candlesticks. We're going back to the tab excuse me, the tabernacle now. These are the seven spirits of God and they resemble the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 
The Holy Spirit is light in the Word of God, family. It's, he, he's the light. Now, I'm drawing to, to an end here. So we go from, from here um, to verse... Can we go... We did... Is it verse 6? Thank you. Verse 6. Now, family, I'm going to end with this. In these six verses, out of this um, revelation, this is what I believe our Father wants to drop into your heart as His children for this week. Amen? Are you ready? Yes. Sit up nice and straight. Yes. Yes. Put your seatbelts on. Yes. <laughs> Take a deep breath and let's do this. Also, in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal. Amen? Symbols, family. I sat down with with my king and I, and, and I said, Lord, what does this symbolize? What it is, does it represent? For me, as a flawed human being, a plain and simple fisherman for Jesus, please, Lord, describe this to me in childlike words so that I can understand. Family, you know when Jesus said to the disciples, he was ministering to a crowd with the disciples, and it was getting late, and Jesus needed to pray. And he said to the disciples, get into this boat and go over to the other side, I'll meet you there. Have you noticed that in that story, that when the disciples got into the boat and they left, not one of them asked Jesus, look, Lord, by the way, we take in the only boat, how are you going to get there? Why? Because they knew what Jesus could do. They knew the Son of God, in a blink of an eye, can move from one place to another. We can't, but He can. So they get into this boat, and in the middle of the night, the Bible teaches us, I'm paraphrasing now, that this boat is being rocked back and forth by a, an immense storm. And they're busy panicking and crying, and, and you can imagine these 12 men, men, crying. Oh, we're going to die. And then one of them shouts, look! I love that word. That's one word that draws anyone's attention. The other day we were in, I'm, I'm, I'm moving off of the point now, we were in um, a warehouse and one of my boys was looking for something and he couldn't find it and the, the second one found it and, and unbeknown to anyone in warehouse, he shouted at the top of his voice, look! And the whole warehouse went boom. Yeah. And so in the storm, one of them shouts, look! Yeah? And they see Jesus walking on the water. Yeah? And one disciple gets out, his faith um, suffers a bit, and, 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 he, and he starts to see, what does Jesus do there a second time that he did with the disciples when he fell asleep in the boat? He commands the storm to settle down and be still. There's a translation, I couldn't find that Bible translation, that says... The, the, um, the waters became like glass. Still. Family. This. Also in front of the throne. There was what looked like a sea of glass. The peace of Jesus flows from the throne of the Father. Without Jesus calming the storms in our lives. We will permanently be crying and screaming and panicking and... We need him to step into that boat for him to say, be still. Be still. Be quiet. I, I don't want you bothering my sons and daughters anymore. Amen. And then this is, this is a beautiful picture of what the Lord showed me. And hopefully you can see it as well. I'm, I'm missing. Oh, there we go. Please, the second, the, the one after this. Look at this train in, in Canada, family. This is a train that's almost entirely made up of glass. What is the main purpose of glass? To see through it. Amen? To see through it. Have a look at everyone in this train. They are focused on what is outside of the glass. Amen? Have a look at the next one. Look at that. Same thing. Everyone is nailed to what is displayed 
on the outside of this pure, crystal, clean glass. Amen. Have a look at the next one. Whoops. This family, and the next one, please, Sister Sonia. This is glass that is not fulfilling its purpose. Can we have the next one, Sister Sonia? Whoops, no, before that. No? Okay, let's stick with that one for now. So, so family, the, the intended purpose of Jesus is to look through Jesus to see the Father. Amen? That is what the Lord, I'm paraphrasing now, is what Jesus teaches. You cannot go to the Father except through me. Except through me. And this is the question that the Lord asked me, and I want to present it to His people this morning. If we go to the next one, please, Sister Sonia. Can people see Jesus through me and through you? You know, sometimes, family, we are so full of ourselves that that's all that people can see. Our egos are in the way and, and, and our, our status and our wealth and, and, and what we represent in society. That blocks people from seeing who created me. Amen. And so this is a question, a personal question that the Lord asked me. Can people see Jesus through me? Oh, and by the way, Jacques, can people see Jesus in me? Because just as those people standing in that train could see to the outside what was happening there, if you stand on the outside of the train, you can see what's inside. Amen. Because of the clear, crystal, clear glass. Have a look at this scripture, family, and this is our challenge for this week. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine. The person sitting next to you because you are perfect. Did I get that right? Oh, sorry. That's the Google translation. It says examine yourself to see whether you are in faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course... You have failed the test. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> Amen. Listen what this, this apostle is saying to us, family. As a church, he's saying, test yourself. Leave the person next to you. Test yourself first. See if you are in the faith that Jesus wants you to be in. Jacques, look at your own life. Stop looking at the, wife, at, at, at the life of your wife. Look at your own life. Fix your own life first, my boy. Make sure that you are in this faith, my boy. Amen. How quick is it, family? I know I've been there. And maybe even I'm still partly there. How quick is it to make a culture, a religion? Just like this. Amen. If you were born a German, you... You, you, you can build things. If you were born an Irish, you can fight. <laughs> yeah. So it becomes part of who you are. And so here, the scripture is saying to us, Jacques, examine yourself. You know, I, I, I spoke to a family member, maybe it was last, last Sunday or somewhere along the line. I spoke to a family member and I, 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 I said to her, when we take this book, Family, and I want to try and demonstrate it this morning. You can open this beautiful book anywhere and point to any scripture and read that scripture and test yourself to see what the Lord is saying to you according to that scripture. Any scripture throughout the whole word to test to see where my standing is with Jesus. Family, I want to encourage you this beautiful book was written from the heart of our Father for you and for me to get us closer to the throne. That's the aim of this beautiful book, family. It's not to confuse us. It's not to cause us to argue with each other. No, John was 70 when he wrote this. No, he wasn't. He was 95. 
That's got nothing to do with my salvation. He wrote the book. Yeah? Amen. Amen. We can so many times get into ridiculous arguments about this beautiful book and not see what it was intended to do. And that was to get us to the throne of the Father. That's it. Amen. 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 And so we... <laughs> I love this amen from this mom about. Um, so family, going into this week, take this scripture and, and make it personal. Test ourselves, family. Look at our own lives. And, and yes, we're going to find flaws. We are. Especially if the Holy Spirit steps in and says, Hey, my boy, you missed these 77 things here. Yeah. Just look at this, eh? Amen? Yeah, I mean. and, and that's what the Spirit of God does, family. He comes and he, he, he shows us where we are moving away from the, the, the throne of the Father. And He shows us these things that we have to put into place to be aligned with this that we just read now. And so if that is you this morning, family, I want to invite you that I'm going to end with prayer now. When I'm done, anyone sitting here this morning that desires maybe a word from the Lord, personal word from the Lord, or that desires prayer, one-on-one -on -one prayer, our three elders will be standing in front here I want to encourage you to, to stand up and, and, and come to the front. To say, Lord, here I am. I'm confused in this area. I can't hear clearly. Can you please maybe just give me guidance? Amen? So if that is you, I want to call you right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that in six sentences these, this morning, Father God, I believe that you have changed some of our lives forever. Lord, we are looking at you and, and at your word in a different um, light. We are seeing the throne of Father God in a different light. We, we are seeing the story written in your word totally different this morning, Father God. All you desire, Father, all you want is to get us back to your throne so that you can dwell with us, Lord, so that you can have fellowship with us. Forgive us. Father God, in Jesus' name, for almost every day, denying you that pleasure, Lord Jesus. Forgive us, Father God, that our egos and, 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 and our, our, our everyday life, the busyness of this life gets in the way, Lord, and, and we shun you one side, and then when we're in trouble, then we run to you and almost demand that you stand up and help us. We pray this morning, Father God, that for those who are hungry for you, hungry for your presence, I call them out this, 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 this morning, Father God, that they may experience you in a brand new way. So thank you, Father. This is going to be an interesting, blessed week. For those of us who are stepping into this week, Father, I'm going to examine ourselves and see that if we are standing in the faith and if we are not, Lord, that it's not the end of the world that you are there to help us, Lord, to get back to that faith. And so blessed be the name of the Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. We bring you glory, honor, praise, and thanks. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you. We bring you glory, honor, praise, and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen, amen. and amen. Family, our elders will be here. Please, I'm inviting you. Thank you.